And for my next trick, a complex AI model from nothing. Meet Madison. She's a great person because she loves to help people. That's why she works as a technical expert helping customers. She works at Saluto by Asurian. Actually, she used to work at Saluto by Asurian. For anyone who doesn't understand, Saluto Tel Aviv was closed down about two months ago, sending 120 employees home, 120 amazing workers looking for new work. But beforehand, she actually did work at Asurian. And her job was to help people. She was a technical support expert on a messaging platform, using this platform to support tens of thousands of people all around the US and even the world with all the technical issues. And she enjoyed what she does, but it was actually very hard for her because she, she used to have to type the same messages again and again to the same customers. And it was very onerous and very difficult. Or in corporate speech, that's a pain point. Here's an example of a message that she has to keep on retyping again and again. Wouldn't you get annoyed having to type the same message again and again? And here are other messages that she keeps on having to retype. You see, we're actually dealing with the problem of a much larger scale. Asurian had tens of thousands of customers needing help with hundreds of experts there on the line giving help. And with all these messages going through, we're dealing with the problem of a much larger scale. Hi, I'm Matityahu Sarafsida, and come and see how we used AI to make Madison's life much easier. I'm going to share with you our journey that we encountered upon the way with the data collection and also the modeling process and the challenging face and the challenges face. And also, I'll show you how we built a complex AI model reaching a high accuracy from the little amount of data that we had available. But first, a little bit about myself. Born and raised in Houston, Texas. I made Aliyah in 2010 and moved to Israel. I've been working in AI since 2015. In 2016, I earned my bachelor's degree in telecommunication systems engineering from the Jerusalem College of Technology. In 2019 to 2022, I was working as a data scientist and a team leader at Saluto. And recently, I joined PayPal as a data scientist there. Here's an example that my team was working on. We created for Madison initially a canned messages library, a prepared list of ready messages that Madison can simply open, scroll through, select the desired message, and send it to the customer, saving her much time from typing these long messages. But Madison has her own personalized canned messages that she added to that list. So in addition to the default list that we gave her, with her combined of personalized canned messages, that list became very large and actually took more time to go through that whole list and to look for the canned messages. So we decided to use AI to recommend and auto-suggest those canned messages from the library, saving her that time. And for the first iteration of the project, that's the focus of this, pr of this presentation, the focus was predicting the permission to troubleshoot canned message. A certain message that Madison sends initializing the whole troubleshooting phase in this chat platform that we built in Saludo. Examples of the message are, can I ask you some troubleshooting questions? Or I need to ask you some troubleshooting questions to understand your issue. Will that be OK? Why this specific message? It was a business and a product decision. It gives assurance to the customer that the problem will be properly investigated. And it creates a unified message amongst all of Asurian's mechs. It creates a unified language, I'm sorry, amongst all of Asurian's experts when dealing and troubleshooting with the customers. The data collection, creating something from nothing. You see, ideally, the way I would like to humbly make a data set is to go through all the chats that happened, some sessions which used that permission to troubleshoot can message, and some which didn't send it to a model, let the model learn when to suggest the next message, which is that troubleshooting can message, and that's it. However, these are a histogram of all the can messages. The troubleshooting messages were very rarely used, about 50. And we had very few actual instances of that message. Because many times, because not necessarily every chat session used the message. And those which did, 
Not necessarily did the expert prompt that message. Maybe they used their own personalized and their own version of the can message. So we have to find those similar messages, those personalized messages that weren't that exact copy that we provided and we wanted to predict, but it's our own version of the message. And we needed those messages to add more ones, to add more yeses to our data set. So we use NLP fuzziness. Fuzziness in NLP is the technique of finding two strings that match a pattern approximately rather than exactly. For example, apple. So fuzzy matching would take APLE, APPL, and the most classic, apples, as a match. So using an exact search that we did in the beginning, we only found 50. But with fuzziness, we actually got more data. However, it didn't yield still enough data to create a model. So you're using a Levenstein distance? Yeah. Ah, okay. There we go. Bokshikavanta. So we divide the fuzzy match hybrid algorithm using regular expressions. Those are those exact patterns that we knew what to expect, exact match as well. The edit distance, Levenstein distance, and manual hand picking. This helped us get us more data, but we still needed to grow. We didn't have enough data to create a model yet because a messaging session was at least 50 messages. This can message, if it was ever used, was only used once per session. And we want a model that will go through the whole session, will go th in real time, go through all the messages, and say, oh yeah, that next message is probably a message that's this can message I want to predict. Let's suggest it. So you need a lot of labels to go and build a model like that. And to get these labels, we use the power of semi-supervised learning. Semi-supervised learning is a method in machine learning where we use a small amount of label data in a training set to create more data from unseen data and use that model to label that new data. We'll see in a second. But it's very interesting. Semi-supervised learning has been proven in research to yield many times good enough of a result that many times that will be the ideal solution instead of a fully labeled data set. And this is what we did. We devised the semi-supervised algorithm. We first started with that small pool of permission to troubleshoot CAN messages. Then we calculated this fuzzy match using that fuzzy match hybrid algorithm with all the other potential messages that flew across the chat system. Anything that matches the match threshold was added to the pool. And then, in the beginning, when it was scalable at least, we reviewed all the matches and removed anything incorrect. And finally, rinse and repeat. We went back to the top and did it again, growing that pool in each and every run of the canned messages. But it got more interesting as it evolved. You see, at first, we had a small amount of labeled data. And when the correlation is high between complexity of a model and the amount of data you have, to, you, to make a model to help us label more data, we were very limited in the, in the complexity of the model. So we used a weak algorithm, the fuzzy match hybrid algorithm, regex, edit distance, that combined algorithm. And we used that model to help us label more data so we can finally make a final model used in production to suggest that next message. But then we evolved to a Charmeleon. You see, after more data was collected, we were able to start using more complex models, TF, IDF, bag of words, and et cetera. And yep, we even became a Charizard. Once we got even more data, we had enough data to do deep learning projects. Because once you grow in complexity, you're able to also add, because of the data, you're also able to do smarter algorithms, such as deep learning and encoders. Now, in semi-supervised learning, you also need gold labels. All we did just now was the soft labels a label for a sample, which is the output of an algorithm, the soft label. But we also need gold labels, that high quality, human label data, labeled by who? Human beings. But we didn't have any. That's how we got into this problem in the first place. So we created synthetic data. By going through all those sessions, which didn't have that can message or didn't use it, and we injected our own version of that message, like it, you know, synthetically, into that message. And this also gave us the ability to kind of control the language of the messages by generating, by generating synthetic data. But the beauty is in semi-supervised learning, you don't, know, you, don't, you don't need that many gold labels compared to soft labels. We had about a 25, 75% ratio, even 20% and 80%, sorry, of soft labels to gold labels ratio. 
And finally, we had enough data to create a model. We use all these weaker models and this evolution of models to help us label data. And finally, we're able to move on to the next stage, the modeling process, urging our nothing to finally learn something. A little bit about, about the model's features. We use the sender, such as the expert or the customer, as a feature. The message number was a meta feature. What number that message was amongst all the messages that happened in the chat? Because we learned that this certain CAM message happened usually at a certain area in the messaging, in the session. We encoded the message checks with Google's universal sentence encoder. And we also used the length of a message as a feature. Now, actually, we had a three dimensional data set n samples, x features, but we also had a history. Every message had with it that 10 previous messages leading up to that message. And with this three-dimensional data set, we split the time series data into blocking windows, because we just had a ton of data, so we didn't have to recycle using a windowing method. With the label of every sample being, is the next message something as is that next message a permission to troubleshoot CAM message that I, the model, should be suggesting? And we had a high class ratio of a 98 to 2% ratio. 1% being that next message is that permission to troubleshoot CAM message being only at 2%, and as, a, as you probably predicted, the model couldn't converge. So to increase that one's presence in the data set, we use undersampling. By moving from a target label ratio of 98 to 2% to 89 to 11% ratio. And we started heading in the right direction because the model could st finally started converging. This was due to the good label proportion. You see the imbalance was high enough to resemble that reality because these CAM messages weren't commonly used. But it was low enough for the model to be able to converge and to learn from that once class. However, we still weren't optimized according to the business because that once class, that 11%, wasn't the focus of the loss function. The, the loss function of the model used and, and mainly learned from the 89% representation. But the once class is also important. I would argue to say on a product level, maybe even more important, also, we used the F1 half score in instead of the MCC as a validation metric. Because on a product, on a business level, precision was slightly more important than recall. The precision is when the model was accurate in sending the message at the right time. The recall is the model's missed opportunities, the conversion, the money. So precision being the customer experience, on this side, on the expert side, of having a good experience, being suggested a message at the right time, was more important on a product level than the conversion of the session and that money saved, as known as the recall. And we also used the focal loss. The focal loss actually helped the model learn from that smaller representation of that once class and still learn from the 89%, answering a business problem of at least giving it more equality, if not more. But what is a focal loss? So imagine you're at a soccer game, two teams, Barcelona, Madrid, in a stadium packed of hundreds of thousands of fans. All of a sudden, there goes Messi. And scores a goal. Goal! 70,000 Barcelona fans are yelling, goal! Now, everyone at home is watching the game, and they're able to hear those, th those three TV telecasters talking about the game. But how? Those three people are in a stadium of 70,000 fans with people yelling goal and everything else they yell at a soccer game. How could they hear them? It's because the audio room, the sound room, implemented a binary focal loss. It amplified the sounds contributed by those three TV telecasters present at that game, that one's class, and lowered the amplitude of the sound contributed by the 70,000 fans. And the same here. The binary focal loss lets the model better learn from that smaller representation in the ones class and reduces a little bit the contribution given by that zeros class, letting the model better learn from that ones class as well. And the rest, what's history? The loss converged, the F1 half increase, and finally using, and finally our final model was 85% on the F1 half micro, 64% on the F1 half macro after optimizing and early stopping, and we created our final model. Finally, Madison, 
she's working. And there it is. She should send that message. But this time, the model is here. And it's able to suggest Madison that proper message for her to send, thereby saving Madison much time in looking for that message, helping her deal with all the people, and giving them the support that they need. Thank you.